Good afternoon and welcome to Across the Pitch. We're the soccer show for people who think Mackham is a kind of canned fish. <laughs> uh, a mackerel is, is, of course, the uh, the canned fish. A mackerel is uh, well. Well, there was a whole bunch of them at the Wham Stadium uh, yesterday, wasn't there, Darren? They certainly was, Phil. Uh, probably half of the the crowd was made up for, of uh, Sunderland supporters, otherwise known as Mackhams. Yes, that I uh, I actually did a little bit of research. Now, one of the most interesting things uh, that I've started learning uh, is all of the different regional dialects within uh, England. Uh, of course, we uh, discussed the, the famous Scouse accent from that famous commercial that we won't talk about here today. Yeah, but... I, don't, I don't know about that one. <laughs> that would be the uh, the Liverpool accent. It, it Scouse actually is a kind of soup that's popular in the area, and that's where that came from. Now, in the Sunderland area, folks are called Mackham, and that is specifically the football supporters, but it, it actually comes back from the old shipbuilding industry in Sunderland, and uh, apparently the dialect would be that they would pronounce along the lines of something like the best ships of the world we mack them and and that's where it came from you know what phil i didn't even know that myself so you've taught me something the u.s the u.s uh, soccer <laughs> pundit that you are now has informed me of uh, the nickname i obviously knew they were called mackums but i had no idea that, uh, where it came from to be honest <laughs> Well, you know, I, I had to do a little bit of research, and, <laughs> yeah. and that's where I, I came up with that. But uh, yeah, uh, so it's all out there, isn't it, on the internet? <laughs> yeah, it sure is. So that you, uh, you were at that uh, that game yesterday at the Wham Stadium, which was, of course, the League Cup matchup between Accrington Stanley and Sunderland. The Mackups did go home happier than you did from that one, but uh, tell us a little bit about how things were, were looking at the stadium. It was your, your first time to see a uh, a live game on the new pitch, right? Yeah, the, the pitch was fantastic. Uh, it was a good atmosphere. I mean, some sometimes in the Caribou Cup, the, the attendance is uh, uh, not always the best, but this was helped by the, the, the following from Sunderland, which was significant, of over a 1,000. So it made for a good atmosphere. Uh, the pitch was, like I said, the pitch was fantastic. The whole ground in general was looking good. It was a nice evening. Just a shame we lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I saw you You had some uh, pictures there of a pretty good look at the sign, didn't you? We did. The across the pitch uh, advertisement was in all its glory in the fan zone. People were enjoying a beer all the way around it. And it's right across the kiosk from where you can buy a. Uh, a pie, pie and a pint. So uh, everyone, it's full visibility to everyone. So hopefully uh, people will notice it this season. Excellent. We uh, were super excited for for having our sign in the Wham Stadium. And just uh, quick thanks again to Peter Latham for for helping us make that happen. And uh, like you said, the the game it didn't quite go the way that we wanted it to. Now uh, in the first half. Uh, things uh, ended up 1-0. There was a uh, an early goal by McNulty that held up for most of the uh, the first half. In the second half, things got exciting because around the 61st minute, there was a, a penalty kick awarded. Colby Bishop cashed that in for his first Stanley goal. Things were knotted up. Unfortunately for Aki down the stretch, Sunderland made some substitutions. Aiden McGetty came on the pitch uh, within, I, I'd say it was two or three minutes of coming on the pitch. He had single-handedly beaten three or four defenders on his way to getting a goal. And then Charlie White kind of put things to bed by getting the third goal. And, and I want to say what was around the, the 85th minute. 
Yeah, so, I mean, the the first half was pretty low-key. Uh, Sunderland on top, but not too much in it. And Stanley played quite well, I thought. And then second half, Stanley came out really well. I think John Coleman and Jimmy Bell have probably uh, got into the ears of a few Stanley players and, uh, and wound them up, as they normally do. Uh, came out with a positive approach, and we got a, got a goal, an equaliser. But as soon as Aidan McGeady came on, I, I thought... There was no way back for Stanley, to be quite honest. He's, a, he's you know, he scored a great goal, but he's a, he's a class player. I mean, he's playing in League One, but to be honest, he's a Championship player as a minimum, really. So he made the difference. If when you've got a player of that caliber on the pitch, it's always it's going to have an effect, isn't it? At some point. <laughs> well, well. Speaking of Championship caliber players, Stanley fans got a chance to see. Their first glance is a guy who was playing in the championship last year, and that's Courtney Baker Richardson, who started up front alongside Bishop yesterday. What did you think about Richardson in his debut? Here's he was a guy that, that had 17 uh, appearances for Swansea in the championship last year. He, he did okay. Uh, it's too early to say. I mean, it's, it's just his debut. I don't know what kind of pre-season he's had, how fit he is, what he's coming to match fitness. He showed some glimpses of, you know, what he's obviously capable of. I thought of the two up front, Colby Bishop shaded it. Thought he was uh, looked a little bit livelier, but it's early days. Not just for those two, for all the new players. I mean, somebody told me last night that there's twelve new signings altogether. Mm-hmm. So it, yeah, it's going to take some time to for him to gel and get used to each other. Uh, a couple of the, well, most established players played well last night, especially at the back. Mark Hughes and Ross Sykes, I thought, were very good at, at centre-back. And, yeah, it's going to take some time for all these new guys just to settle in. And you don't know where they've come from in the country and move move to Accrington area for the first time and new teammates, etc. It's going to take a while. Well, that's the thing that I've noticed is there there really is a, a lot of cohesion with the back four, the back four. Those are guys that have been there. Those are guys that you can count on. And yes, that 12 signings you mentioned, that was something that I did uh, also here on the broadcast yesterday. Uh, And that's a lot, especially because these are players up front. Uh, These are guys that are not really all that experienced either. A bunch of guys that are 22, 23 years old. Uh, You have Joe Pritchard, who's 22 years old. Uh, He came in in substitution uh, yesterday. He started the first I was going to mention, Joe, yeah. He he, he, he came on, he he played very well, I thought. He looked very composed on the ball. I thought he was probably, you know, one of our better players on the night, even though he only came on as a substitute. And they have him in that number 10 role, which for a a guy that young, that's, that's really a big ass. Yeah, well, I th- it looked promising. Like I say, it's, it's early days, and so we've had a we've had a tough start. Obviously, we went to Lincoln on the first game. I don't think any team would have wanted that that fixture for the first one of the season. Lincoln away, newly promoted team, full of confidence, uh, played really well, full crowd, you know, full full house, for, and a great atmosphere. So that was a tough place to go. Then we had the Bury game cancelled for unfortunate reasons for Bury more than us, to be quite honest. And and then straight into this tough cup tie. So we'll, we'll see. And after six, seven, eight games, we'll, we'll have more of an idea than what we've got now where we're going for the season. At this moment in time, I've no idea based on those two games I've seen. So let's actually talk about Lincoln for a minute because they are our team of the month. And wow, I mean... We don't want to talk about that first game against Stanley too much. But since then, they went into Rotherham. They beat Rotherham, who's a team that they dropped down from the championship in their building 2-0. So they're 2-0 league right now. They haven't allowed a goal yet. Then yesterday, they went and played Huddersfield in the Carabao Cup. 
didn't start half of their starters, and they still beat this team to drop down from the Premier League last year. And, and so Lincoln is a team that was playing in League Two last year. Huddersfield was a team that was playing in the Premier League last year, and Lincoln went in and beat them with their B team. <laughs> what did you think about yep. that? Well, I'd be amazed if Lincoln aren't in the playoff positions. You know, I'll put my neck on the block early on in this season. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm tipping Lincoln uh, to be in playoff position minimum this season. I just think they've got everything going for them. They've got you know bright young management team, good blend in the in the squad of experienced players, some local players, and then they've added to them. Particularly impressed with Jack Payne, who, who spent some time at Bradford, I think, last year on loan. He played against us. He's a good player. Mm-hmm. You know they, they're bringing on the likes of. John Akindi, who's a, who's a sub, who's someone I've always rated when he, he played for Barnet. They've got a good squad, good settled squad, good management team. The crowd are all, you know, they're well up for it. They've had, what, two promotions in three years and Wembley yeah. appearances. And they're, 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 they're riding the crest of a wave. I know it's a cliche, but they're, they're really up. Everything's going for them. Yeah, it really is in that the Cowley brothers, they're doing a great job in there. And like you said, the, the two promotions in, in three years. And ju- just to give you an idea of where Lincoln has come from, I, I have this famous map on my my wall in my office that, that I always talk about that has all the, the different football clubs. As far as I can tell, and this map, I think it was printed around 2015. As far as I can tell, Lincoln is the only club currently in league that isn't on my map. And and so I, I mean and there's there there's teams like Real and Bangor City on there. I, I mean there's some some clubs on there that uh, I mean I, I yeah. think there's something like uh, hundred and fifty clubs listed in it. So back in two thousand fifteen when they made this map I guess Lincoln wasn't even considered to be one of the top 150 clubs in <laughs> oh. in, in England or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and now they're they're all the way up. They're they're knocking on the door. And a guy that you yeah. didn't mention is George Grant. And this is a guy who's got two assists in two games. What did you think when you saw him play against Stanley in that first game? He seemed like he's going to be a dominant player at this tier. He did. Uh, I've seen him before, and he's a, he's a good player. But I, what I will say, there were so many of them who were flying and playing well. I, I wouldn't say he particularly stood out more than anybody else when they played Stanley. I just thought the whole team looked like, you know, really good, compact. They've got the right blend. They can play it a bit. They've some physical lads as well, and uh, I, I think they'll do well. And the whole and going going back to the Lincoln on your map. I mean, I went there. That was my first visit to the ground. Actually, I've never been, but. Lincoln's the type of place. It's that far off the radar. It's unless you're going to Lincoln for a reason, you never pass it. If you know what I mean, I don't know if there's places <laughs> like that in the states. Well, yeah, it's funny because whenever I, I Google it, uh, there's actually a Lincoln City, Oregon, that comes up first for me. I, I guess Lincoln City, Oregon, is you know population of like. 900 people or something yeah. like that. So I, I, I think they, you know, they're they're pretty. I mean, obviously, Lincoln City's uh, bigger than that, but it's yeah. just uh, that, that that tells you right there is if you know at least if you're googling from the U.S. and you put in Lincoln City, it's going to give you the the 900 people in in Oregon first. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, the, even the 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 town itself, well, the city itself, uh, the. But it, it was really good atmosphere. Or just about everyone in the crowd had the shirt on, so it was colourful. They've got a massive stand there for by League One standards. But the whole day was, apart from Stanley losing, was you know a really uh, fantastic day. Really great atmosphere. There was a fan zone and away fans. You know you could mingle in there, no problem. And it, it was a really good club. I left thinking, you know, I hope they do well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in having them be our team of the month, we, we've had a number of teams of the month, and you know, there there's certain teams that, that after the month is up, kind of the month is up, and then there's other teams that, that we've continued to follow, and I, I think Lincoln will certainly be one of those teams that we continue to follow. Yeah. 
But let's talk about a few other things because I, I know that we've we've gone pretty deep on on Stanley and and Lincoln here. But you're going to be doing some extended coverage on a team that's on top of the table in League One right now, and that would be Blackpool. Uh, what's going on over in Blackpool right now, Darren? Right, well, very similar to Lincoln in many ways. I, I just think they they've got everything going for them this season as they head into the season. So yeah, fortunately, I'm uh, it's a new new venture for me, following a different team and uh, doing some write ups and which I'm looking forward to as more of a neutral instead of being passionate behind Accrington. But I, I still I still like Blackpool as uh, one of the Northwest clubs. But I'm going to be doing some extensive writing and match previews and I, I see them doing well this season apart from the obvious they've won first two games I think they've they've got a lot going in the favour uh, main, the main point is uh, the manager I think getting Simon Grayson back to the club has been a, 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 a big point for them uh, a big plus point I, I think they've got everything they need to have a sustained push I can see them again top half of the table no problem and I think they'll be aiming much higher yeah, I mean, right now they're the only team so far that that's looked better than Lincoln. There, they're two and zero plus five goal differential, and it's just to me they're going to have that boost from finally getting Oyston out, uh, and you know, just that the players that, that yesterday or that should be the players that last season were walking through a picket line, now they're yeah. walking to a, a full house full of passionate supporters and i i think that alone is just going to make a huge difference yeah definitely i mean the feel good factor just to get the supporters back at the ground They've obviously been staying away for their own reasons and i i can totally understand why and it, and it, you got to say it worked in the end you know they've, they've got managed to get the ice and family out which everybody in the town seemed to want and i can understand <laughs> why uh <laughs> But they've, they've got a good team as well. They've got a good manager. They've got a couple of good experienced strikers. They've got a, a keeper on loan from Rangers. Uh, and one particular player who I think is uh, a top uh, performer in this division is Jay Spearing. He's a, a midfielder who played for Liverpool early on in his career. I think he played 30, 40 games for Liverpool before dropping down. He played for Bolton, I think in the Premier League and definitely in the Championship. He, and he's a he, he's the type of guy. There's not many of them who can actually control a game. You know, put his foot on the ball and really, you know, slow pace down or speed it up just as he wants. And uh, that's important. Yeah, I really think that that their team last year they finished tenth in spite of everything that was going on. And you have to figure they were a little bit better than tenth, maybe yeah, to begin with. Like you said, they, they've added Grayson back into the mix. I, I think that you know, they could easily be a team that, that we see playing at the championship next year, and it's, it's going to be exciting to see you cover them all here. Yeah, well, I'm hoping to get to a few games, uh, working for across the pitch, and maybe do a couple of match reports. I've got a friend who's uh, who's works there, Rob Hayes, who a lot of Accrington Stanley fans will know from his time at at Stanley, and hopefully he can open a couple of doors for me and get a couple of interviews, and we can get behind the scenes down at Blackpool and see what's going on. Great stuff. I, I can't wait, and, and hopefully we'll uh, have some uh, some guests in to, to tell us about... Uh, you know, as, as I understand, Blackpool is kind of the, the Las Vegas of England. <laughs> you could say that, yeah. It's the nearest thing we've got, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the reason that I brought that up is because it's a good segue to our, our next conversation here. And, and one of the things that, that you were mentioning was the idea of following a a match preview for uh, being a neutral. And I find that that whenever I'm doing a match preview as a neutral, that, that I tend to do a lot better at predicting the scores on those ones. That, yeah. <laughs> and, and last week, I, I happened to uh, to hit one right uh, right exact on the the Ipswich Sunderland, uh, and that uh, that brought you to ask me if I had uh, put any quid down on it or not. Yeah, when I saw the result, and uh, I even I mentioned to my wife, 
I said, oh, Phil's done well with that, picking that result out. I'm sure, I wonder if he's put a few quid on. And then I, I, I checked myself because I don't know about the betting laws in certain states in the US. So maybe you can uh, tell us a bit more about that, Phil. Yeah, well, that that's actually a really interesting discussion because so here in the United States, up until about two years ago, the only state where you could legally bet on any sports was in Nevada. Now, they have opened that up. It was about two years ago that that Congress here finally, Congress would be our equivalent to Parliament, (laughs) finally uh, opened up where we're nationwide that states could make their own laws. Many states have already opened up to it. For instance, I, I know New Jersey did more sports betting action than Nevada one month was like the first time it had ever happened and things like that. In Arizona, where I live, the latest news is saying 2021 is when it will be legal here. Uh, it has to do with their, uh, there's some Native American tribal casinos that have rights to all of the gaming in Arizona, the casino gaming in Arizona right now. And I guess they're on the fence whether they want to get involved with the sports betting aspect of things or not. So now the state is having to negotiate with the tribes on how they're going to do the sports betting. And that's basically what the holdup is here right now. Wow. So if you if you manage to win a few quid, I want half of that or I'll be ringing the police telling them you've had a bet, Phil. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I might, have on, to, uh, might have to phone uh, phone some things in. I mean, on a serious note, there's quite a bit of controversy in in, in England, UK about uh, betting in football. Actually, I think there was something on. I saw a report. One of the newspapers, I don't know if it's Guardian or Telegraph, had done a report, and over half of the Premier League clubs were sponsored by a, a gaming betting company. And yeah, there's ten, quite ten. a lot of yeah, yeah, yeah. There's quite a lot of people who have been affected by gambling and have complained and said, which I can understand. You know, it 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 can be a problem for some people, can't it? Uh, fortunately, I'm I'm quite, as they call it in England, quite tight with my money. So a couple of quid's enough for me on a Saturday. <laughs> but uh, but it is a controversial subject, especially with Wayne Rooney's uh, part of his deal going to Derby, isn't it? He's is it yeah. 32, I think they're called, and he's, the, he's put 32 on his shirt, and it's all part of the deal, isn't it, with him coming back from the States? Yeah, so here, here's my understanding. is So I believe the name of the company is 32 Red, and then so okay. thir- 32 Red is already the, the sponsor of Darby County. Darby County. <laughs> <laughs> You've got both words right this time, Phil. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so they're already Darby's uh, sponsor, and uh, so basically, Wayne Rooney is coming over in January once the Major League Soccer season ends over here. He's leaving DC United, coming over to Darby to become the player manager, and he is uh, player player par- coach, Phil. Play, player <laughs> coach. That- I'm sorry. You know the difference, as uh, yeah. Aaron mentioned the other night on Coach and Manager. <laughs> yes, play, player coach. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and as part of the deal, uh, he's going to be wearing the jersey number 32. And, and so apparently where the controversy comes down to is his wearing the number 32 is in part of an endorsement deal with 32 Red. And evidently, there's a rule that a, a player can have a sponsor patch on the back of their jersey, but it can't exceed more than, I believe, four centimeters by four centimeters. And obviously, the number 32 on the back of the shirt is larger than that. So it's being decided whether they're going to let him do that or not. Wow. No, I yeah, I didn't know to that detail, but yeah, it's uh, and I think what's also added to the controversy is uh, Wayne Rooney's been in the headlines, amongst other things, for uh, <laughs> losing quite a bit of money on the odd visit to the casino, put it that way. So, yeah, he's obviously had issues with it, but I mean, 
Wayne Rooney losing, I don't know, how, how much, half a million quid in a in an afternoon or a couple of hours, it's probably equivalent to us losing 20 quid, isn't it? That's the thing. Is I mean, some of those guys have so much money that, uh, you know, you hear these stories where, you know, like you said, he loses 50000 50, in an afternoon. I mean, that's... Uh, that's not even a whole game check for him. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to think it won't last forever for the likes of uh, Mr. Rooney, will it, this money? So if you keep throwing it at, at the bookmakers, it's going to run out at some point, I would have thought. We've seen it happen before, haven't we? Oh, yeah, I in, mean, in all sports. Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly, there's there's a lot of stories out there. I, I don't think that, that Wayne Rooney specifically is a guy that, that we're going to see uh, you know, on the bread line anytime soon. But <laughs> I wouldn't have thought so, no. <laughs> I mean, Wayne, Wayne Rooney is just one of those guys where he, he always seems to find himself in the news somewhere or another. And not always yeah. for scoring goals. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. He's, he can always hit an headline, can't he? We we could probably uh, sit here for the the rest of the the podcast until Wayne Rudy stories. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's let's not. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, one of the uh, the exciting things that we have is we have uh, yeah. In addition to to you uh, joining our team last season and now full time this season, we have quite a few new contributors uh, joining us from England. Uh, especially uh, Daniel O'Rourke, who uh, wrote an article for us last week. Why, why don't you tell us a little bit about Daniel? Because you, you, uh, you're you friends with Daniel over there, and, and tell us a, a bit about him. Yeah, so Daniel's a, a young guy who's looking to get into sports journalism. He's just finished his degree. Really nice, nice young guy. Uh, I had a chat with him, and he, he just needs to get some experience, put himself out there. So he's, he's going to write a few articles for us this year, a few match previews. He's done his first one. I thought it was excellent. And hopefully there'll be plenty more this season. Yeah, I really liked his first one. He had some good in-depth information, and that was on the uh, the South End and Portsmouth game, if you have a chance to go back to our website and check that one out. We also have Tony Robinson, who we, we've mentioned on the show quite a few times is the, the Accrington native now living in Canada. However, every year he travels back to England to attend a few games. September of this year, he's going to be headed back, and he's going to be sending us some, some guest reports while he's over there hanging out with you, Darren. Yeah, I mean, uh, Tony's probably one of the, the biggest contributors for, on the Facebook group, and... Uh, so hopefully, I mean, when he's over, he's, he's like you say, he's over for a couple of months. He might be able to join me on a podcast. Hopefully, we can everybody can hear him speak. Then, <laughs> no, he's a, he's a great guy, Tony. He's a, he's a good supporter of uh, of Accrington, he, and he, he's a thoroughly decent guy. Well, not only is he a great supporter of Accrington, he's a great supporter of the show, and you know we just can't tell how much we we appreciate uh, all of the uh, the comments and, and everything that that Tony puts on Facebook for us, and we're really excited to have him uh, do some live reporting for us, and that that sounds like a great plan to to get all of us on a podcast together while he's over there. Yeah, that'll be great. We'll try and uh, sort that over the next few weeks. I've noticed you've even recruited a, a photographer as well for getting involved at the Sunderland game last night, Phil. You, you cast your net further afield. You've got a, a Stanley fan as a photographer correspondent now. Yes, uh, that was what the other thing I was going to mention is, uh, is John Earnshaw, who my understanding is he, he is a photographer over in Accrington. He has his own photography business, but he also does uh, go out to the games and, and he started sending me over some shots and videos from the games that they were going to be posting on the, the website. And it, it sounded like he's going to be sending those over throughout the season. And I, I was really excited yesterday. He sent me a video of Colby Bishop's first ever Stanley goal, the, the penalty kick. So you can go in and check that out on our Facebook page or our Twitter. Uh, I think that, that we were the, 
the first ones to have uh, have a video of the the Colby Bishop goal online, thanks to John. Yeah, it was it was good. I, I noticed he took a still shot as well from behind John Coleman and Jimmy Bell. It was excellent. I don't actually know John. I've never met him, so I'll, I'll make it uh, my business to to introduce myself <laughs> to him. Reckon when I when I get the chance. But he he's, he's took some uh, some superb photographs. Yeah, and he uh, he sent me over some that, that I've put on the Facebook page, so you you can see all of that. And and then, and then of course you sent me the uh, the pictures from the the fan zone before the game. So I, it's just fantastic to have uh, have so much coming over uh, across the the pond, and you know we we yep. truly are becoming a an intercontinental podcast here. <laughs> That's the one, isn't it? Yeah. And I've spent some time in Ireland this week, so we're uh, not quite all the way across the pond. <laughs> I've uh, been, uh, been speaking to some people today in Belfast, and uh, they're quite happy about Linfield. And that's uh, the club. They're in the Europa League and they've won two consecutive games for the first time since 1966. Which is quite an achievement. So they're in. I'm not. They're in a playoff now. I think to to go into the group stages. Oh, so wow. the, the the people of Belfast who are Linfield supporters are extremely thrilled by that. There's a guy called David Healy who's the manager. He, he he's played in the Premier League and he, he's a he was a good striker. Uh, now don't ask me to pronounce the teams who who they've beat. <laughs> but there's a team from uh, team from Montenegro, and now they've got a team from Azerbaijan. So they've uh, they're, they're, they're well up for it. These guys over in uh, in Ireland are well ex- really excited. But well, well, you did all right on Azerbaijan. So that <laughs> yeah, I'm okay with the countries. It's the actual teams <laughs> that I struggle with. <laughs> yeah, Car- I remember Carabag, that you wrote. Oh, Karabag. Yeah, I I Carabag, actually... Yeah. Yeah, Carabag, they uh, they're actually a very very interesting team. They're the uh, they're they're coached by uh, Gerben Gerbenov. And right. Gerben Gerbenov <laughs> is actually the all-time leading scorer for the Azerbaijan national team. Uh, now right. he coaches at Carabag and takes them into the Europa League just about every year. I I remember all of this because they, they were in the same group as Arsenal last year in the Europa League. Right. Well, as far as I know, I think Linfield play them in the, the next round in this uh, playoff game to get into the Europa League group stage, which I'll don't, – don't take that as factual. That's what I've understood today, but I'll, uh, I'll check it out. Well, well that's an interesting – It's one to keep an eye on that, isn't it? Yeah, that that's an interesting matchup because uh, the Karabakh, they really are a very interesting team. They're the, the they're the PSG of Azerbaijan, if you will. Okay, right. <laughs> interesting. We'll get, we'll, uh, we'll we'll give that uh, we'll keep an eye out for that in the next round. See who makes it through. Yeah, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll be able to uh, to catch that one on a stream, or or may, maybe do a match preview on that. I, I remember you uh, you wrote about some of these teams a few months ago. I did, yeah, I did a little preview about the uh, preliminary rounds, didn't I, of the uh, Europa Cup and the, the the small clubs that were involved, and now it's heading towards the. Uh, the group stages, I suppose, the the remainder of who's left is they're going to get some big, big paydays, which will mean a lot for the clubs, won't it? Oh well, yeah, because once you get into the group stage, that's where the TV money comes into it. Exactly, yeah. All right, well, I think that that we have one more thing that we wanted to talk about here today, and and that was said that I I think you've been talking to some potential guests who may be joining us here soon. Yeah, well, I'm. I'm lining up some potential guests and I want to try and uh, link it into something that's happening at Stanley at the moment. Uh, Peter Leatham's done some great work in putting a Hall of Fame together. So there's some notable players from our past. We've mentioned it before in the previous podcast and they're, they're going to be putting putting pictures up of them, etc. So I'm trying to get one or two of those uh, ex-Stanley legends and try and invite them onto a podcast and one or two have uh, been you know, they're quite receptive to the idea. So I'm just trying to nail down some times and dates now they can join me and yourself and we'll have a 
a chat about Stanley old times, so which might maybe interesting to some of our uh, listeners. Absolutely, I can't wait to have some uh, some Stanley legends on the show because certainly uh, you know some of the the things that that happened. Certainly, anything that happened before that, the league era, will be uh, new new history for me to learn. And, and I really, uh, I, I can't wait to see who we got on. A- anybody that uh, that has Hall of Famer next to their name, uh, that's going to be an exciting guest. Yeah, well, they might even receive a across the pitch fridge, fridge magnet from ourselves. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> <laughs> they're really, the really part of the Hall of Fame, then, aren't they? <laughs> hey, you, you never know. <laughs> well, I, I think that, uh, that we've gotten to just about everything that we had planned to talk about before the show. Was there anything that, that we had skipped over or that, that you wanted to go into a little bit more before we wrap up? No, just the fact that I'm looking forward to the, the season, uh, all the different match previews. We get some interviews, podcasts. It's it's uh, it's a good time of year when the season's starting, and I'm uh, quite excited about it all. I couldn't be more excited. I I really am, and just the the first two weeks of the season, and then the the cup games yesterday. I by by the end of yesterday, I had watched so many games that I I couldn't even <laughs> remember which games <laughs> I had watched by the end of the day. <laughs>